Hello and welcome to the latest talk in the series of Deutsche Bank Collection Live. Meet the artist. My name is Friedhelm Hütte. I'm global head of art at Ways of Seeing Abstraction, works from the Deutsche Bank Collection at Deutsche Bank's Palais Populaire here in Berlin. Today, it is my great honor to introduce you all to Nima Nabavi. Hi, Nima. How are you? Hello. How are you guys? Great to be here great. with you. Yeah. Nima is uh, living and working in Dubai, so we can see you there in your studio and home in uh, Dubai. And uh, how are you? How is the situation in, in the uh, uh, United uh, UA, URA? Uh, everything, like everywhere else in the world, obviously, we've we've dealt with the challenges of the past year. Um, in Dubai, in the United Arab Emirates, they really took action quite quickly. And the system here seems to have worked as far as um, vaccinations and things like that. So I, we really felt like we were in good hands. Like everyone else, though, we've been um, in constant lockdown and, and um, variations of self-imposed quarantine. Um, I've been very fortunate to be here in my home and studio and to just stay busy with work. And I, I just feel very fortunate to be here and to be an artist during the time this time and have something to do was yeah um, and, a great great privilege and you did a lot of work during this yeah. the last months and and even developed a new technique about uh, being um, at home so much and uh, unfortunately in berlin so the palais populaire our exhibition where you are represented with two wonderful works we will see later is close, but uh, the situation is becoming better and better. And we hope to reopen again soon. And the exhibition lasts until February next year. And I really hope you will be able to try. I, I would love to come and see it. It's one of, yeah. one of the first places I want to go. Yeah. So uh, before we start, I have to draw uh, your attention. Uh, to a few organizational points. So during the conversation, please be so kind to mute yourself. You will have the opportunity to post questions afterwards through the chat function. So with the chat function, you can put forward questions uh, to Nima or to myself at the end of our talk. And should you have technical problems, please let us know via chat as well. And last but not least, the talk is streamed by Facebook and YouTube. And um, uh, starting tomorrow, you will be able to follow uh, it and to uh, see it uh, on our website as well. Um, so uh, just a short, uh, short information about uh, Nima's uh, uh, Yeah, CV so far, and he was born 1978 in Tehran, and he studied later in, uh, in the USA, and he got his uh, BH at, uh, BA at, uh, at the University of Southern California, an MBA at the New York University, and then he built up his own business and stayed in US for 20 years, and uh, the business was already giving a little, I think, hint about what Nima's interest is. It was about uh, to work with artists to design streetwear. And uh, as I just learned in our talk before, built up the first online shop for that even in, uh, in the US. And then you moved back because you grew up there to um, Dubai and you had, had had your first solar exhibition at the Third Line Gallery in To, uh, 2018 and um, so some of the early works we will start with and before we will have a, a short um, um, short use introduction to the exhibition itself so I will start the um, presentation now and after that uh, we will uh, talk again and uh, uh, have more opportunity to put forward questions and um, looking for what we've got within the chat as well. So 
Hmm? So um, the ex exhibition at the Palais Populaire, it, uh, it opened um, already, but we had, as I said, to close it uh, um, after a short time. Uh, it's called Ways of Seeing Abstraction. It shows um, uh, more than 160 works from our collection um, with um, very, very different ways of doing abstract art. And uh, so we asked Claudia Wieser, an artist uh, living in Berlin, to do an installation piece in our rotunda. And um, these are some views and it's uh, um, abstraction art with, with more focus on gesture, but as well on color. And we have um, early works from the 60s and 70s, like Gunter Frutung, you see in the, in the background. And we have uh, uh, very new works from the last acquisitions from the last two, three years, artists working with photography to produce the abstract um, um, uh, artworks. And uh, here we are with uh, the two works by Nima Nabavi in our exhibition. And now I'm coming to early works by you, black and white. That was more or less, I think, the beginning. Um, I pass over to Niva to tell a little bit about these works, the early works. Yeah, thank you. I Some of these works, the early works that you're seeing um, were very early experimentations. This is at a time where I was just curious. Um, I think we'll touch on it, but you know, I was very inspired by my grandfather's artwork and I was curious about it and I was beginning to experiment with a bunch of different um, techniques. This in particular, this piece is um, a stop motion graphic basically of, uh, of 12 individual pieces um, that I just made a stop motion frame by frame animation of to show the progression of different patterns. And this is something that I continue to do in my work uh, because there's something very deliberate that I try to do and to show types of progression. And each one of my artworks in, in essence is a moment captured, um, a part of a progression captured. So in the early stages, I was really always making these stop motion animations of each individual piece yeah. to show the way in which they move. Yeah, and we can see another one here. So. Yeah, so each, each, each piece, this is actually four pieces uh, individually hand-drawn and, and I've basically taken a photo of them each in a different position. So the positions keep changing and then put them all together in a stop motion mm -hmm. graphic okay. to show that, especially in the early days of my work, I was always trying to show that I'm doing something quite deliberate, that th these aren't just um, scattered patterns that these were snippets of a, of a larger idea. Yeah, and then the works first with, uh, with the structure itself, the grid, and later uh, we will see adding the color became more and more complex. For example, this one is much more complex than the other ones we saw before. Absolutely. This, is, um, this works on a very similar principle to the first black and white square that you saw, except that instead of just one square doing the continuous movement, you have 256 squares here, 16 inches by 16 inches. Uh, and each one, each cell that you see is one part of that animation. And this actually was part of a 16 piece series. So you see how the, the central area in this one is quite light. Um, by the time you get to the 16th piece, the central areas is the most complex and the outer areas are, are, are the light part. So a lot of my work has to do with this incremental um, movements, gradual movements, gradients, and, and slow transitions from one state to another. 
Yes, this is not a piece of art, but this are the tools to make your okay. art works. And uh, I, I especially ask you to send an uh, image about so your tools, how you're working, to explain to the viewers and listeners that, um, and even later, the, uh, the even more complex uh, works uh, on. on you could think on the first moment looking at them they are made uh, digitally so because it's difficult to imagine that they are made completely by hand yeah and um, as I saw the most complex one I guess where you used even painting you took took two and a half months to really make one um, one piece and maybe you can explain a little bit more and I will show the next image then about how you how you're doing it how you're producing it uh, technically yeah the large majority of my work is um, ink rulers and paper um, in that image that you saw there was uh, I use these very specific engineering rulers to make the marks and make the notes that I use. So you can see the two rulers on top. They give me increments of 1 16th of an inch, which is about two millimeters. And, and I also included the, in the top left corner post-it notes because I, I line post-it notes up at the very edges of the artwork. And on them, I make all the marks and all the notes about what line is gonna go where. I use these um, uh, Japanese micron pens that a lot of architects use, it's archival ink. Um, and you can see that they're all, I group all my pens together based on which ones have been used to what degree. So I always try to keep pens rotating. I try to keep everything as accurate as possible, um, but it, it just comes down to these, these tools. I don't use a compass. I don't use um, anything really much more complicated than this, even with the with the painted piece, um, I was using paint in marker form, um, as you can see there. So these ones that you're showing now, uh, these are all ink um, and ruler, and that's it. Yeah, and you're working in uh, um, several um, uh, phases. You uh, did your works. You worked in with series, so it's not just one. So it's a it's yeah. like here it's a series of works and as 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 we could see here uh, yeah. as well and what we will see later as well what is interesting you make um, a new artwork grouping them again in a geometrical form so yeah. it looks more like one artist one artwork than a series actually for me exactly and and in a lot of the cases um the reason I do it is to, again, show that there is a deliberateness in it and to show that each one of these artworks is part of a progression, part of a movement. So you can see in this particular artwork, Series 2, um, it's eight artworks and they, they move around in a loop. It's eight colors, eight artworks, and each artwork, the pattern stays the same, but the color shifts by one. And so you can see how many kinds of variations show up. When you look at each of these individual pieces, they all look quite different from each other, but the patterns are the same and the colors are changing. Um, so I think that I think that there is something in these, of course it is very time consuming to make eight instead of one, but I think it captures something that is fascinating for the viewer and ultimately, uh, my main goal with the work that I make is to create, there's always an effect that I want to have in the viewer's mind. And I think the more complete the story is, the more thorough um, their appreciation of that visual effect can be. Yeah, so, and here we see what you explained, some of the detail yeah. of, of that work. So and this, this art, that artwork that I, with this, that was 64 tiles, the previous artwork. And um, again, it's incremental movements, but it's moving in 64 steps. Um, this particular artwork is, is a one of one. And this was the same pattern laid out in a, uh, 
on top of each other in a variety of ways. So it's four different sizes of the same pattern continuously on top of each other. So this is what you would call like a, a self-similar fractal where um, the smaller versions of itself create part of what would be a, the, the bigger image. So there are a lot of these phenomena that I learn about and then I try to experiment with um, and represent visually for the, for the viewers. Yeah, fractal brings me to, to the next question. Um, so it was written uh, about your work that it has this, um, of course, and yourself in your statements um, to mathematics, but um, um, on the and uh, with mathematics um, as well to um, Islamic patterns, so that that yeah. is one of the um, sources and. Um, and to nature, so that is um, uh, that is one of your quotes um, as well. You said, uh, um, uh, uh, quoting your uh, late grandfather, "The whole universe is in these grids." So, yeah, um, maybe you can tell a little bit about um, about this this idea about how it's linked to nature. I think that, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the work that I do, I have a lot of interest in quantum mechanics in the sense that I'm very interested in what the fundamental units of reality are, what the fundamental fabric, fabric of reality is. And, you know, the, the further and further you zoom in on reality to find the kind of the ultimate building block of, of what creates uh, nature. Um, you know, the, from my understanding, the more and more you, the further you zoom in, the more things start to look like mathematical objects, theoretical objects. Um, and these are, are the types of things that I imagine snippets of that fabric of reality must look like. I think with my grandfather, when he would say that the whole universe is in these grids, I think what he was referring to was also that, you know, the deeper you go into geometric kind of exploration, the more uh, strange it seems, the more baffling it seems that, that these things that create order, that these things, are actual phenomena on their own. These aren't things that we're, I don't ever feel like I'm creating this artwork. I feel like I'm discovering something um, that is a phenomena of our universe. And I think that that's also why when people are, are attracted to my work, it's not because I created it, it's that I think there's something universal, a shared understanding, a shared um, affinity that we have for this kind of work that to someone as strange as, for instance, something like this looks, there are some elements of familiarity. And so I think what's interesting about this work is why is it that um, accurate reproduction of a, an idea of order or a structured thing, um, why, is, why is correct maths also beautiful? Why does it also look interesting? And so um, I think that that's one of, the really intriguing parts about it and how it connects uh, for me to nature is that this is part of a shared appreciation that we all have for um, geometric expression. Why do we all like symmetry? Why are the most, um, you know, we spoke about spider webs, we spoke about honeycombs with bees, um, the structure of a snowflake, all of these things that are um, shapes built on efficiency that ultimately nature is efficient in a certain way that they also tend to be quite beautiful. And so I think that that is, is the interesting um, connection for me uh, between geometry and nature and maths and things like that. Yeah, thank you. And uh, you, you quoted uh, um, something and uh, uh, I, I heard uh, uh, 
I read about it as well, that if uh, if a mathematic formula is really right, et cetera, very often or normally it's beautiful, it has an aesthetic. Yeah. So that is, yeah. uh, and I think that's interesting too. So that it is in, in the nature, the symmetry and all the examples you, you mentioned and that even um, there is a relationship between aesthetics and math mathematic. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's, um, and also when you look at not just Islamic geometry, but uh, early art in Native American cultures, in South American cultures, even if you go back to cave paintings, you, you'll see spirals and you'll see um, circles and there, there's something about shapes um, that's always been part of our um, journey as humans. And, and that's why with my work, I always endeavor to make something, for instance, th this screen you're showing now, the octagon um, piece, when you see it up close, it has so many levels of um, layering that it almost becomes really quite strange in some parts. But it's one of the things I try to do is create work that seems quite strange, but also really familiar. You can still see an eight pointed star here. You can still see certain things that are very familiar. Um, but when you look at it zoomed up, you can also see things that might look like parts of animal skin or, or ripples in the sand. And so um, that's the other thing that I think that through the layering, intense layering of different kinds of order, new shapes, new patterns emerge. And these shapes and patterns then become a lot more similar to patterns we see in nature that don't seem to be geometric, like the stripes on a zebra's body, for instance, you know? Uh, so I think that, that um, again, that's, that's how it brings me back to the question about nature. Yeah, and uh, uh, what, what I maybe have to explain to the viewers, um, so it's impossible to reproduce your artworks uh, digitally yeah. here in, in the stream because they, they really change with each move um, of, of your face or if you go closer or with, 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 a, with a bigger distance, it's really um, kinetical works as well. And as there can be different uh, shapes coming up uh, because of the angle you look at that and this is really art you have to see as an original otherwise you yeah. get only an idea I think we can we try to give a good idea about it but uh, to see them as originals is is something more than um, to, to see them as um, as re reproductions here's a closer view and you closer you look at it you see all the different layers and uh, yeah and and details and um, that's the other one in the exhibition the kite and yeah. uh, so we can see again that uh, this is uh, was part of the series and it yeah. forms a uh, another artwork as well and it uh, builds up with uh, the space between the frames uh, another uh, grid as well yeah. and uh, what is very special when uh, we, this is a very recent acquisition for the collection and uh, uh, the only chance to buy your works was at the fair online so with first time I could see them was really um, before when they came arrived in Germany before the ex, um, before the exhibition um, but uh, and to see this this this, this uh, dynamic in it but what was I fascinated when I saw them uh, in the gallery was this that the um, the, the shape uh, uh, correspondence with the frame as I think this is very uh, unusually I like it from the very beginning um, so the octagon and the kite form this is really very rare to see it like that so what is what was your 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 reason or why you feel you, you, we saw another example that was um, the shape of the artwork itself was was different to the frame yeah. so uh, yeah. now these two especially uh, the frame is following the artwork itself and this gives a special effect 
Can yeah, you talk I, a I bit think, about that? Yeah. Yeah. The more I worked, um, I think I've gone a a little bit closer to understanding exactly what it is I want to do and what's um, able to be done. And and I've been working with a framer here in Dubai, um, a gentleman called Zane, and he's. Uh, He's very fascinated with the artwork and he really works very hard to make these things happen. And um, because of that, I've now, I'm, I've been a bit more courageous to say, okay, I think this has to be in this shape. This should be this thing. And sometimes I also choose to keep it in a rectangular shape because I want the, the focus to be in a different place. But when I start with an artwork, I. I try to envision the, the artwork on the wall finish and what, it's, what the overall feeling is going to be like. And especially with this, um, with the octagon shape initially, uh, I thought it would be interesting to show it as a completed thing that it was not just a drawing, but that the completed framed artwork was a unit of art in and of itself. And I'm also quite conscious that at the end of the day, the work, um, I want always the work to have a visceral reaction. I'm someone who loves going to museums and I know the feeling of walking into a room and from a distance seeing something and saying, I want to see what that is. So for instance, even with this artwork, I'd like it from a distance to have this kind of multicolor polychromatic, um, holographic almost feeling so that you come close and when you get close you see the level of detail in it as well so there is this kind of balance between it. and this is yeah this is another recent one that I did with the upside down upside down triangle and then to echo the the triangle within the artwork again to um I think it ties it in again I always try to show that what I made was made deliberately that this isn't just um me throwing a bunch of lines together so i always try to give little indications that this was done on purpose yeah and I th is this the one I'm, i was not sure to prepare the um the present day is this the one on canvas yeah this is uh i during the pandemic after i finished the the 11 pieces The, the kite shaped ones that you just showed, um, there was a period of time where I produced enough work that, that the gallery was satisfied. And I said, okay, I'm <laughs> going to try to experiment with some stuff. So with this artwork, okay. what I did is I incorporated these pixels, painted pixels in the background. And there's something about 16,000 painted pixels in this. And on top of them, I drew um with black paint um with a black paint marker and created the lines on top of it so that there is a pixel layer and then there's a line layer on top of it and um i was really satisfied with with that with that effect yeah so um the the closer view the details here give an idea how it's made but this is again i think an artwork You have to look at uh, as an uh, as an original. Are you planning to to do more um, paintings besides your drawings, or is this one experiment? And you you would like, prefer to go to go further with the drawings? No, I'm going to. I think that at this point, I think it's it's a. I was very satisfied with this experiment. I'm going to follow this path, mm -hmm. and I'm going to continue on the path with the with the drawings as well. I think that they're all connected. All of my artworks eventually, so for instance, as an example, if you see the, the curved lines at the edges of, of that, the, the canvas piece the, that you were showing, the curved lines in that piece, actually, after I did this piece, I did the triangle piece that you were just showing and those curved lines became um, something I learned while making this piece and then I made that the next piece, the triangle piece and incorporated curves in it. So 
for me, a lot of it is that as I'm working on a piece, because it's so much, um, a lot of these artworks are just repetitive actions. And I think that's where once you repeat an action hundreds of times, then suddenly your brain, brain goes, well, why don't I try this? And then so as I'm finishing an artwork, I'm already getting excited about the next thing. <laughs> so um, I'm very, I think that I'm satisfied with the way in which I incorporated um, paint in this. I think the, we showed this at Art Dubai and seeing people's reaction to it was very uh, flattering. And I think that um, I'm going to follow all these paths of curiosity and, um, and see, where, see where they all go. I think that that's the kind of the guiding principle for me has always been, what am I curious about and what are people responding to and can I take it further and can I make it um, stranger and more fun and, and keep going with it. Right, so that, that's wonderful for the end of the presentation, but we both are still, um, still here and we will be now in a different format. So okay. and this one moment, please. So great to have you there again. Great. And thank you very much. Um, I think that was re even for me, I read uh, several essays about your work was some really interest interesting new information. And um, so what, what are your plans? What are, is there something, a new series you're working on? Yeah. Or new plans at the moment? Uh, right now, I'm working on a um, commissioned series um, for a client, and it's 11 artworks, and it's, a, it's of the ink drawing um, genre, and, but it's, it's interesting in that each piece is only one color, so uh, it's a 11-piece spectrum of colors, but each piece is... 10 layers of colors and they're like horizontal bars that increase in size and then decrease back in size. And it's for a, a 12 meter hallway. So I'm always very um, appreciative actually of, of opportunities where I have a, um, a tiny bit of a prompt, uh, a, a situation where they say, this is the space or this is the color we like because the, Geometry is infinite and the yeah. ideas I have are endless. I don't know, I need a tiny bit of a boundary around it so that I can say, okay, I can do this for you. So I'm working on yeah. that commission piece now. And at the same time, still experimenting every day with paints. Um, one of the things I would like to do in some future pieces is to, I'd like to make some work that um, the, the visual effect is very prominent from a distance and from up close, it doesn't look so, um, I, I don't want it to look so clean up close. I'm trying to work on some paint styles where it looks messy and incomprehensible up close, but have a, a interesting effect from a distance. Okay, so, yeah. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. That's yeah, so I'm, I'm always <laughs> trying new things. So, <laughs> really interesting. You know, so. So let's have a look if there are questions in, the, in our chat. Uh, is there, there are no questions? Okay, so I think you answered a lot of my questions already. Okay. So, so really, thank you very much again, Nima. All the best for you. And uh, so I really hope to see you uh, in, in winter or the autumn here. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Berlin. And... Uh, All the best until then, and thank, thank you, you so very much. much. And thank you very much uh, for and, and I just want to say that I, I really appreciate um, all the art institutions during this time period have been extremely supportive. I think as an artist, I would say that um, it's been really touching to see how much these institutions have um, made efforts to, in a difficult time, take so much of the um, work online to really support the arts, uh, to the clients that are supporting, to the institutions that are supporting. I think that as an artist, I can say we're extremely grateful. I think uh, I just wanted to say that 
you know, during a, a tough time, uh, the fact that you guys were still acquiring new works um, was really great. And even in setting up this talk, the amount of preparation, I don't think people realize, but the amount of preparation that goes into this, um, and I know setting up this art, uh, this exhibition and then having so many lockdowns come up, it's, it's such a challenging thing. And I think that um, teams like yours, um, have made it really, um, really interesting time for artists like us. And uh, from my perspective, I just want to say I appreciate it and to the entire team that's spent so much time putting just this talk together. I really appreciate yeah. uh, we have, it. Have, we have one question and some comments and the one comments is okay. so I, I really <laughs> like because she is my next guest in the talk, Adriana Janine from Vienna. She says, fantastic work. Thank you. Thank you and Johannes uh, just wrote, Dear Navi, do the structure of your paintings have got something to do with the role of ornaments in traditional Islamic art? So this is a question by Johannes. So um, I think that, you know, I, I always have to make the disclaimer that I am not a authority on Islamic art. I'm not an expert or nor do I claim to be from a, um, to be in Islamic art, um, so to speak. But my grandfather was greatly inspired by Islamic art and I was greatly inspired by my grandfather's artwork. So there is a definite connection of inspiration in that field. And also living in the Middle East, there's always obviously Islamic geometry is all around us and it sparks a lot of interest and enthusiasm in my mind. Um, I, I just know that there's a lot of people academically that are into studying Islamic geometry and they'd be the first to tell you that maybe I'm not um, in that direct um, field. However, the one thing I think, um, how I do think I am connected to it is in the same way that I think any artwork uh, in, in those traditions that I think the artwork was made to create a sense of awe within the viewer, uh, a feeling of a representation of the infinite. So I think that when you see, when you walk into a mosque and you see these insane um, ceilings made with so many tessellated patterns that are infinitely changing, that feeling that's conveyed um, is a representation of the infinite unknown. And I think that there, that, when those early practitioners were doing those patterns, those patterns weren't a motif or a decorative element. They were the first time they were being seen. So I think that the craftsmen at the time must have been saying that we're going to do something that is going to really move people. And in that desire, I think that I have a connection to it, that I try to make work that's not a recreation of a mosque from a hundred years ago. I try to make work that in the spirit of the guy that made it a hundred years ago, who was doing something for the first time. So I try to um, go into new areas. Um, and that's why I say, I don't think that I'm from any particular lineage. I actually don't, I didn't come to this through Islamic geometry. I didn't come through it through mathematics. I didn't come to it through the art world. I never went to art school or anything. I came to this as a person who was curious about the work that my grandfather was making. And that curiosity started creating new questions within me. And sometimes it would be answered by a calculation and sometimes it would be answered by an aesthetic. And, and I would just keep, keep moving there. Thank, that was a very good explanation, I think. And I, when, when looking at your work, um, I can totally understand this background. And maybe one last question came in from Cordula. Um, Navi, are you inspired by Bridget Riley or Vasarely? Absolutely. Um, they're both two of the greats. Um, and um, absolutely, I, I find that connected to what I just said. I think that someone like Bridget Riley or Vazarelli might give the same answer to say that, listen, we're 
we're moving in the geometric world and we're trying to make things that, um, you know, for both of these artists uh, at the time, they would call it op art, optical art. And sometimes I think some people thought that that was a, not a, a flattering thing to say, but I think it's amazing. I, I think the work that they make, they work both work a lot with color. They work in a way where the viewer's mind is also activated. So part of the artwork is see, is happening in the viewer's mind. So yeah. Bazzarelli, Bridget Riley, Saul DeWitt, yeah. Agnes Martin. Yeah. Um, but I think actually uh, the, the person I would uh, say that I, I feel <laughs> very strongly connected to artwork wise is a, a Swiss artist from the twenties, uh, Emma Kunz, who's a, I think in the past few years has been, her work has been um, recognized. But if you look at her work, she, she came at it from a, um, she was kind of a healer and a nurse and a, she had kind of a spiritual understanding of things. But if you look at her work, it's exactly what I'm talking about in the sense that mm -hmm. it doesn't seem like it's connected to any particular tradition. And so I think that she's um, probably one of the people I feel most inspired by because every time I see one of her works, it, it baffles me and it, it feels very interesting and you can't tell where it's coming from or where it's going. So, um, yeah, I, I think that what I always say is that the field of geometric art, as far as I've experienced it, all of the artists are very supportive of each other's work because it's infinite and we all pick one little area to explore deeply. And so, uh, yes, I definitely, I'm, I'm a huge fan of, of a lot of, um, all the people that you think I'm inspired by, I'm probably inspired <laughs> okay, by. Great. Thank you very much, Neva. And uh, thank you very much for sending uh, the questions, uh, dear viewers. And bye. Yeah. And